welcome everyone i i just want to thank everyone for taking out the time i know uh, we work out of different time zones and that's kind of the essence of gpods fellowship uh, i am ishan uh, i'm the co-director of uh, gpods here with me is arpit uh, we would be doing a quick welcome address to you guys and then we'll switch it over to john and christina who would be uh, helping us welcome your excellency uh, who is with us today uh i just want to quickly uh, talk about how gpods as an idea wishes to collaborate uh, facets that are otherwise uh, practicing in different compartments of public life so there's public policy diplomacy and sustainability and and gpods came up as an idea to promote sustainability by way of all of these different tools that that we come across uh, to make effective policy changes uh two three things that are very important uh, for us uh, to establish a qualitative gpods cohort so congratulations to all of you who are part of it uh, and for those of you who are still joining in uh, second thing is imparting quality skill based expertise Uh, and that is not restricted to what we learn in books or what we study in in institutions but also learning learnings from people who have worked in the space on the job uh, and thirdly by providing you with the network and the opportunities therein uh, to help not just meet your career goals but also explore your professional opportunities that lie in front of you because of your career choices or professional choices uh so that's the basic idea of gpods and again i welcome you all arpit uh, just a quick uh, few words and then we can switch it over sure i think uh, just hello to everyone uh, it's the first time where uh, just the gpods fellows are coming together and uh, uh Uh, uh it's a privilege to be interacting with uh, her excellency uh uh ambassador blais so uh without further ado i'm going to hand it over to jonathan and christina uh to welcome the ambassador all right thank you ishan and arpit i really appreciate being here good morning everyone from new york city my name is jonathan cummins i'm the vice president of the americas for gpi I'm also a member of the steering committee for the Alliance of NGOs and CSOs for South South Cooperation, which is a committee that works directly with the UN Office of South South Cooperation to advance the goals of civil society in the global south. I'll tell you more about that because I'm a mentor as well, so eventually you'll hear me speak. So, I'm so happy to be here and you know, one of the things that we want to stress with gpods or rather one of the themes i've noticed is that there is this idea or this desire to build bridges and not walls right because right now it's very imperative for us to work on building bridges because if you think about it and we're living in this once in a generation pandemic or i, I at least hope it's once in a generation um global economy is tanked there's a rise of authoritarianism um there's a massive strain on our global health which people aren't really talk of, talking about and that's very important so right now more than ever before uh we need to focus on positive and effective multilateralism which means that we need to build bridges and not walls and i'm so grateful to be in here and i look forward to hearing from you all and working from you all and Hearing from the ambassador, and with that short introduction, I'll turn over to Christina. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina. Thank you so much, John. So um, I am the senior strategic communications coordinator or manager at Giant Oak, which is um, an AI for good artificial intelligence company. But my background itself is on the intersection of peace and security systems. Um, so I couldn't be more proud <laughs> to introduce Her Excellency Ambassador Louise Blaise. um because she at one point was around Atlanta North Carolina that's home for me um but she herself is the deputy ambassador of Canada to the United Nations currently um and she has special responsibility for agenda 2030 and development she was appointed to the executive board of UNICEF in 2019 
And prior to her appointment to the UN, she was the Consul General of Canada to Atlanta, Washington, DC, and Tokyo. She has a background in art history, um, and that's really awesome. So you should ask her about that. Um, but I think you'll learn a lot. Uh, as a reminder for webinars in general and these sessions because of Zoom, make sure that you stay muted until it is your turn to speak. Otherwise, the sound gets all messed up for everyone. Try to make sure that you keep your camera on if at all possible. It helps to really enforce the human connection. And I know this is the first time you all are meeting together. I think it's important that everyone sees your very human face instead of the computer screen. Um, and feel free to ask as many questions as you want. You're here to learn. Um, as was mentioned earlier, and mentorship and answers from practitioners are so important. So this is an unparalleled opportunity for you to be frank, to get frank answers from a current um, deputy ambassador. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ambassador Blyce. Um, and thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Christina. I have to say it's always wonderful to be introduced by a woman and uh, especially one that has ties to the Southern United States which is a place where I, I spent three years and I really fell in love with the region. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. This is really the first time that all of you are together and I get to be the one welcoming you. Um, and this is why really I intend to be fairly short because I just would like to throw some thought provoking uh, ideas uh, your way. And then I really would like to have to hear back from you and we can have an exchange. Um, and don't be afraid to ask any question that you would want to ask, um, even if they may seem a little uh, even uh, sort of uh, out of context. I'm, I'm here really uh, to open up and to talk to you both about what my work, uh, what I'm thinking about where we're going now, and also my own, my own life trajectory, if that's of any interest um, uh, whatsoever. So um, let me just launch in with a, a few thoughts. Um, First of all, I should have a disclaimer and preface my little uh, very short introductory, uh, introduction talk by saying that I'm not a multilateral expert. I came from the world of diplomacy. I came from bilateral relations where one country engages with another uh, on bilateral issues. When I was asked to come to the UN, I thought, I looked behind me and I said, uh, why me? Because I really do not understand this multilateral world. I was actually to be honest, a little intimidated because it's, it's seeped with rules and procedures and exactly the kinds of things that I feel sometimes hold us back from getting uh, the real work done. And so I was a little bit apprehensive, but uh, was convinced to come. My main goal was to, uh, to run Canada's, uh, I was gonna say failed attempt, but I think we, we succeeded in so many ways, but our unsuccessful attempt at the gaining a seat at the UN Security Council. The vote was in June. It was a three-year project for me. I dedicated my life to it. And trust me, <laughs> it's day and night kind of effort. And with my team, and in a split second, the results come in and you find out that you're unsuccessful uh, at, at gaining the seat. I want to say we were unsuccessful at, at uh, obtaining the seat to the Security Council, but I think we were su successful in our diplomatic uh, push. What it caused us to do is really re-energize all of our bilateral relationships with 190 countries around the world. There are 193 members, but we don't count ourselves. And of course, our co competition, we don't count them either. So it was really 193 countries that we had to uh, either uh, rejuvenate our relationship with or, um, or uh, some, in some cases, address some of the irritants that might have existed. Uh, Canada is a popular country around the world, but we also have our challenges. And so those came out uh, very clearly in, in the campaign. But while I was running the campaign, of course, as Christina said, I was also responsible for Canada's engagement on the issues of the SDGs and Agenda 2030. So those two things were, were going on at the same time. And that's really what we're talking about uh, today. So never has the world, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm not saying anything you don't know, but we've had never faced uh, a universal crisis of this magnitude since World War II. And even I would, I would, I would say that probably uh, climate change, and that's what I'm talking about first, is probably 
even more all-encompassing in terms of the globe and its impact than World War II. Uh, so you have this incredible crisis that is brewing, uh, some aspects of it scientifically, some not so scientifically, having huge impact around the world uh, in, 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 uh, in basically every single aspect of human life. And then you get hit this year with a, a worldwide pandemic, which not only was a medical crisis, but is turning out to be uh, um, an enormous crisis in terms of socioeconomic impact. There's not one aspect, again, of our livelihoods and our, our well-being that is not impacted by COVID-19. Um, and, and so all of a sudden, the world is affected by the same crisis at the same time. Sure, in different ways, perhaps, but it's a universal crisis. What is fascinating to watch and observe, and this is what you're, you know, we're here to discuss, is how does the UN system, the multilateral architecture that we have built over the past 75 years, and it's the UN system uh, and beyond, how is it responding? Is it responding sufficiently? Is it responding adequately? And how are member states and how is the world coming together to work? And the UN has tried over the years to involve civil society in its deliberation, its decision making, its, its reflection, and to a certain extent, we've been quite successful. So, so civil society tends to be NGOs. That's who tends to come to the UN. But who hasn't been coming to the UN up until recently are players like some national governments, provincial governments, city uh, management, and the private sector. And even within governments, federal governments engaging in the UN, there are silos. I'll give you an example. Those, the parts of the Canadian government and the parts of most governments that getting engaged with the UN tends to be Minister of Foreign Affairs, so the Department of Foreign Affairs, development, and if you're in the developing world, you might have you know, education and all those other areas that engage with the UN system. So the Minister of Finance, Minister of Transport, Infrastructure, all of those groups are completely outside of the UN and, you know, apparatus. And we, for the first time yesterday, as a result of an initiative that Canada and Jamaica led, we had the ever first in the history of the UN um, finance ministerial uh, that was uh, that was co-hosted by uh, the deputy secretary general the very first time when we all know that issues of debt issues of economic um, development is at the heart of addressing the SDGs which is really was a UN led um, uh, initiative it's not to say that the UN should be at the center of everything but the UN is the best thing we have. It's the only organization around the world that has 193 uh, 93 countries that are all on equal footing. When you walk into the GA hall, it does not matter if you're Canada or United States of America or the Maldives or Vanuatu or Tuvalu or, uh, or Yemen or any countries, you all, we all have one vote. We all have, an, it's an equalizer once you're in that room. Now we can talk about the UN Security Council. That's a different story uh, because there's, you know, five countries that have veto, but there's no one in the UN General Assembly that has a veto power. We all have to pay attention to each other. So why not make it a place where we bring the entirety of the conversation about sustainability? Um, it is, it is, but we, we don't have all the right reflexes yet. And I can tell you that this finance ministerial was three years in the making. It took us this long to convince member states that there is a place for the private sector, for economic, for real hard for profit um, uh, entities, whether it's investment, pension funds, and all those groups to actually um, come and engage with the UN. There was a great deal of skepticism. First, developing countries thought that we were us donor quote unquote countries were trying to replace our uh, aid program by having the private sector do the work for us. Nothing could be further from the truth. We understand, Canada understands that to meet agenda 2030, we have to go from billions to trillions. And the only way to do that 
is with the private sector and civil society and social actors like many of you um, uh, on, on the Zoom today. So we all, but we all have to go in the same direction. And, and, and there is a lot going on right now in these areas, but there's no, no coordination and there is no uplifting of this work in a, um, in a uh, I think in a effective uh, manner. Last uh, point I think I want to just leave with you as we start talking about, about um, these issues is we're facing another challenge. The other challenge we're facing is if you come from a developing country, you know the UN is crucial, it's fundamental. It vaccinates, it educates, it does so many of the fundamental um, uh, services that we in the developing world can count on our own government to provide. So what is happening is that it's clear for all these countries in the developing world uh, how important the UN system is. There is a complete trust in the UN system in most of those countries. Well, complete is, might be a bit strong word, but I can tell you, I'm co-facilitating a resolution on the modalities of a special, a special session on, um, on COVID-19. And the number of countries that have asked to make sure that the WHO gets specified and recognized for its work is, is quite impressive. Then you turn around and you know that there are countries that would probably don't agree with that. And those countries that don't agree with that, there's not the majority, but they tend to be developed countries. So in those places where we can benefit from a strong um, uh, government and we have all the services and the UN doesn't have a country office and the UN is not delivering services, there is skepticism about the work of the UN because these countries, and, and it's not necessarily their governments, but their the populations don't really see what the UN is, is accomplishing every single day, helping millions of people around the world. And there is a lack of appreciation for the benefits that in turn we as developing countries receive from that greater stability and that, uh, around the world. So we have a lot of work to do and it is really a challenge that we're having right now with COVID-19, for example, uh, where some countries, and it's the same with migration issues where people, you know, some countries are just focused on their own uh, well-being without understanding that everything is interconnected and that the UN is at the heart of the solutions. Um, that we, we must uh, put forward as, a, as global citizens. So um, I'd be really delighted to hear your views on that. What can we do? We're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the UN this year, 75 years. And, you know, I can't help but think that probably if you're sitting in some countries around the world, you probably will not hear that it's the 75th anniversary. But there, there, there is a... a Unfortunately, a lack of attention to the UN uh, in, in places that matter, in places that are responsible for financial commitment to the UN. And, and I can tell you, even in my own government, Canada is extremely engaged with the UN uh, in the multilateral uh, world because we understand as a country, as a middle power, it is a, definitely a super important for us to be, to be a, a major player in these organizations. But at the same time, there are others who, who feel that the, the, the UN is, is overfunded and has different, you know, I don't need to name names here or what is a, what we're seeing, observing. And some of these are actually um, fundamental to the well-being, financial well-being of the UN system. So we have a challenge and, and how, do we, how do we address it? And how do we address that challenge while at the same time we are tackling two enormous crises? And are those two enormous crises opportunities to deal with that challenge? So there's a bit of a circle there that is, that is interesting. I tend to be in the camp of the latter. I think we have an opportunity here to step up and to demonstrate the usefulness and the, uh, of, uh, of the multilateral system. And by making sure that that multilateral system rejuvenates and reforms itself to be inclusive of entire uh, society so that we really truly do not leave anyone behind, both in services and in uh, inclusive um, uh, problem solving. I'll stop here and I'm really looking forward to this, uh, to this exchange. I hope this was useful 
uh, and as a little bit uh, thought-provoking so we can have a good exchange. Merci. Merci. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a lot of thoughts and I'm pretty sure, Christina, you have a lot of thoughts. Do you, do you want to ask a question, Christina? Or yeah, cover? I think that, you know, um, yeah, I'll start off with a question and then, you know, it's the fellows time. So make sure that you all ask your questions as well. But I think um, I'm very <laughs> interested, uh, Ambassador, in how your experience in the art field and what people consider to be, you know, not so security or diplomacy, et cetera, has really impacted and driven um, how you approach your diplomatic bilateral um, job now and that world now. You know, that's a great question. That's truly a great question. And I think I can answer that very humbly by saying I'm not, um, I'm not your typical diplomat. Um, I, and this is why the UN was, was for me a little bit uh, intimidating. It's because I knew that this is the place where typical diplomacy happens and, and it's full of rules and procedures. And I'm, I'm more action oriented. This is, I come from the private sector originally and uh, I come, my parents were both uh, business owners. Uh, I like the bottom line. I like results. I like to, you know, to see a real outcome of an effort. When you're in diplomacy, it tends to be much more abstract in what tends to be, uh, and you count your, 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 um, you count your successes and, and, and maybe commas and periods here and there because it's, it's unfortunately. That's why I was attracted to, to managing the uh, UN security campaign because I knew that there was gonna be a hard result. You know, We were either gonna get elected or not elected. And well, we weren't elected. But in, um, uh, but it was nonetheless. It was for me a real um, something much more concrete that I crave, and I so I bring that uh, to my work. I bring and I bring the perspective of of the private sector to my work. When I was consul general, my in the in the south uh, southeast United States, my focus was on was on uh, trade and on uh, export development. So I was very, very close to Canadian companies and American companies and, and making those linkages. I've taken that with me to the UN. And this is why I don't have these silos between the different, uh, you know, the different sectors of society. And I think that has turned out to be, to be um, uh, a strength. Um, and one of the things along the way that I, I bring as well is, well, there's two sort of, you could say that I've got two sort of little projects that I always carry with me, the issue of gender equality, both written large and all the big policies of the UN. Of course, Canada is a feminist country and we uh, have a feminist foreign policy, a feminist development policy. But at the same time in my day-to-day -day work, I make that matter in the small little gestures that I make. This is why I recognize you, Christina, and, and having introduced me. Every little bit helps in how we help women achieve true power uh, um, equality, I want to say. Uh, the other one is on mental health and the importance of mental health. And this one I'll connect to my no-nonsense results-based management, which was uh, all that I focused on earlier in my career. It was all about the results. And I didn't have, and that really ultimately led to a, a, a burnout because um, I, I really didn't really understand how to be a leader that is uh, focused on people. And because if you focus on people, you'll get the results. It may take a little longer. It may require you to tap into your vulnerability. It may, um, it, you may have to uh, show some emotion, but if you do that, the results will be, will be there in the end. And they will happen without damaging um, people around you. And, and I was very hard on myself and I was hard on everyone. And I didn't understand that there are, there are ways in which you can really, um, you, can, you can cause damage, which will impact outcome. I mean, it just simply will. And so I really believe that these two are connected, the gender and this one, because while men can do this kind of leadership, women are very well uh, positioned to bring in um, a feminine kind of leadership that where nurturing is not seen as a weakness, 
where vulnerability is not seen as uh, slacking off or any other um, aspects of it. You can actually reach a level of uh, extremely powerful leadership by espousing your true authenticity. And in the case of women, by managing like a woman, as opposed to trying to manage like a man. Uh, we all have our own way, our own style, and that's what makes working environments so, uh, so rich. We shouldn't all be the same. And women bring, we bring our own way. And for too long, I think many of us uh, felt that in order to succeed, we had to play like the guys. And to a certain degree, that can, that can work. But uh, if you work in a very high power, high um, uh, pressure and environment, it will catch up to you. And that's what we're seeing happening. I think there's an epidemic of, uh, of uh, mental health in the workplace, both affecting men and women. And because I, I believe that uh, many of us neglect our true self on our rise to, uh, to uh, whatever uh, ambition we want to achieve. So, <laughs> yeah, um, go for it for, yeah, is that Caroline? Um, just unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Yeah, thank awesome. you, Ambassador. Um, thank you, Ambassador Blaze. Uh, my name is Caroline Rakosvojohovsky. I'm currently in New York. Um, I'm also actually of a different background than international relations and diplomacy. I majored in archaeology and jumped mm -hmm. into the UN world immediately after college. So that's been an interesting learning curve. So I understand. <laughs> Um, I'm curious on what your view is on the role of youth empowerment in creating a sustainable future in a post-COVID world um, in the context of creating sustainable cities and communities. Because in my opinion, a lot of the projects that I do involve youth empowerment because by incorporating youth into the dialogue and actively creating jobs that youth can contribute towards any industry in novel ways. We can contribute not only to the economic growth and um, creating decent work, but also to shape policy. And yesterday, I'm sure you know, was International um, Literacy Day, which is my favorite holiday personally. And I think given the current situation that we are in, where remote education is not a guarantee and not accessible to all youth around the world, but even in developed countries such as Canada and the United States, that protecting education for youth is essential moving forward and is going to help promote decent work and economic growth in the context of sustainable communities in a post-COVID world. So I know that's a lot, but I'm just you know interested in hearing what your viewpoint on the role of youth empowerment moving forward is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that question. It's I laugh when you when you started when you mention archaeology because that was my major when I first got to university. Uh, but uh, I, I failed the I failed the archaeology 101. It was the only class in my life that I failed. And I remember I had a part time job at the time working at an art gallery. And I would, I would dress up because, you know, with the clients were all very fancy and I would go to class after all dressed up. And, and, and so when I failed the class, I went in to see the, the professor and I said, you know, look at my, my other class. I'm doing so well. What did I do wrong? And he, he looked at me. He said, he said, I don't think this is the career for you. This, this is kind of shocking. Nowadays, you would, he said, archaeology is all about, um, a little broom in the desert, kneeling, and 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 it's systematic. It's 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 um, it's very tedious work. And he says, "You strike me as like a person, a people person, and you're going to feel this feel this fairly lonely." Anyway, he, he ended up give, doing me a favor. It was harsh uh, feedback at the time, but, and he was definitely profiling. Uh, but I I I made the switch, and I ended up going to art history, and ended up being. Uh, it ended up being the right move for me. But um, I do love history and archaeology for me is the, the, the draw was the fact that you can actually touch the object that, that has lived and has so much to say. It witnessed so much. So, um, so I still love going to museums, but, um, but uh, that is not my field um, now. But I, um, on your question on of youth empowerment, I think it's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely fundamental. And we're seeing youth make real change in their communities. And even here in New York, I don't know if you're aware of the program where they, they have the, 
the Youth Ambassadors Program, which the city of New York is sponsoring. And they do a lot of activism and uh, in the area of the SDGs. And it's actually fantastic. They do 10 times more what many of us adults do in, in this arena and with such passion and, and they bring so much to it. I had, um, the, I think my most striking moment in, in the GA Hall in my three years at the UN was when Greta came to speak to us. And you'll recall her and truly a, a passionate plea. And it was such a breath of fresh air because this is, you'd never display this in the GA Hall. Normally everyone is reading a script that's very boring, trust me, half the time. Um, but she came, she came there with this story. And I remember the, the seat, Canada seat was packed. We had a delegation from Canada. So I actually was sitting in the stairs next to the Canada seat because you, when you have your ministers and, and, and VIPs come, you, you give up your seat, of course. And I remember sitting there and just because I was lower and there was people couldn't really see, I, I had goosebumps. I was so connected to her emotion. I thought that what she was doing was so important to wake us up us old people and to, you know, galvanizing action. And doubly struck I was after the speech to go up to some of the ambassadors that I just love, you know, the people that I love to see. And we're all a nice little community and to go, wow, wasn't that amazing? And it was no, she's being handled. I feel so sad for her. This is not, you know, there was real skepticism. And then in that moment, I thought, oh my goodness, what a schism between generations and what we, you know, what we bring and, and the approach. So at the UN, we do bring youth uh, regularly, but it's a little bit, I have to say, it's, it's a little bit for show. They're just, they're not really, we don't have a systematic way of engaging them. Um, so I think we, that's an area where I think we, we need to, to work on. And I would put it in the rubric of what I was saying earlier about making sure we engage all of society. On the issue of education, I think you couldn't be more right. And Canada is making huge investment in this area and development with the GPE, which is, uh, which is um, an incredible uh, this global partnership on, uh, partnership on education. We are doing it with a lens on women making sure that uh, because women tend to, especially uh, during a pandemic uh, situation where uh, they, you know, they have to go back remotely, there's many aspects that are impacting women. Uh, we're seeing an uptick, of course, on violence. We're seeing an uptick on, on early um, uh, child and forced marriages because for, for economic reasons. So we're very worried that this pandemic will will lead uh, to a large number of women never coming back or girls never coming back to the classroom. So this is an area we're working very, very hard on. And uh, UNICEF, yesterday we were starting uh, our three-day uh, executive board and uh, executive director Henrietta Four mentioned uh, just the incredible focus that UNICEF is putting on schools during the pandemic and, and making sure that this access of remote learning is addressed. And so it's not just, so, but therein lies the absolute necessity of partnership between a UNICEF and another entity of the UN or the private sector. And UNICEF of all the funds and programs at the UN is the most uh, adept at managing private sector partnership. They're also the only major um, agency of the UN to have a robust fundraising program, right? People donate to UNICEF, but people don't necessarily donate to UNDP or UN Women. Or, so UNICEF is, is, is really uh, in a class of its own, in my view, at the UN. And if, and, and, but they've also now appointed, was two years ago, a new czar Internal, uh, internal to the organization that manages this private sector partnership. Because in order to have remote access to education, you have to have access to the internet. And, and that's not the UN that's gonna provide that. It has to be done in partnership with local governments and other entities. So these are the kinds of um, areas in which we're pushing. We're doing all we can, but I, I, uh, this is an area of real concern. And hopefully we will alleviate most of the impact but um, the jury's out uh, on that.
still. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Caroline. Um, and thank you for your answer, Your Excellency. So we have, I hope I don't mispronounce this person's name, uh, Sashank. Sashank, she has a question? Yeah. Sashank has a question? Yeah, so by the way, you, you pronounced it right. right? I guess it can be close to Shawshank Redemption. So uh, uh, good evening, Ambassador. Uh, I uh, have a couple of questions actually mingled into one. So uh, while I hear you that you said that uh, the UN, right, is uh, a pretty equal space, right, and uh, the General Assembly does not have a veto, right, uh, but lately uh, there's been a grouping, right, which uh, loosely is called the Global South, right, led by China, uh, where there has been a huge pushback, right, against the UN and various Bretton Woods institutions, right, and especially around the world view. Right, that these institutions have propagated over the past 75 years. Right, so a your comments on that. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, there there's been a certain resistance, right, to structural reforms. Right, like for example, right, as uh, many uh, uh, people would say, right, that uh, uh, in the community of nations, right, uh, there is no one person, right, or or no one sovereign. Uh, or no punitive laws, right, that can define, right, or enforce something. So what's your view and, and uh, uh, what's your view around uh, a parliament, right, at the UN where the population of the world, right, elects representatives uh, to, uh, to the UN and uh, that kind of acts as a body uh, over and above national governments uh, as one of the structural reforms. So two parts to the question. Thank you. Sashank, thank you so, so much. I was trying to find a way to, to view you as I respond. There you are. Okay, I just had to move the, the screen. Uh, so thank you. Wow, that's very thought provoking. And um, I, like, I like your thinking. So let me just do two uh, answer in two parts briefly on the first part. So you mentioned groupings, yes. The UN now, uh, the General Assembly is, is, um, is made up in a way of invisible groups that uh, some of them are temporary, some of them just come together on certain issues and then on certain issues they will uh, advocate. For example, we're members of what is known as CANS, which is Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And we often work together and we often have so we'll send one of our experts to negotiate on behalf of three of us, this kind of thing. But it's not on every issue because we don't agree necessarily on everything. Then you have the G77 plus China. That's what they're called now. And the G77 is, used to be 77 countries, but it's now 154 countries. It's a huge negotiation block. And then you have the EU, which negotiates as a block. And then you have... Uh, the Arab League, the OIC, and, and you have different groups that then come in and come out uh, depending on the issue. That has been very helpful for many smaller countries to have their voice heard. We have, for example, AOSIS, and we have, you have uh, groups of people, uh, island, small island states that will, um, that will advance uh, their, their agenda. So by and large, those groupings have been a positive um, for, for the UN, and it also simplifies the negotiating process as opposed to negotiating with you know, every single resolution with 193 countries. It gets a little bit cumb cumbersome, especially just this year, we passed a 70 rev uh, resolution in the GA. Last year it was over 100, but this year because of COVID, it was a little, uh, a little less. So you know, small missions need to, to have that, this robust sort of support. So I haven't really, notice this, this, this negative um, pushback on the UN by those groups. What, what we are seeing is, of course, is, is the rise of, of different views of how the world order should be. So you have on one, one side China with their Belt and Road Initiative, which, you know, which is basically their, their, their national policy, but also one that is, uh, that is espoused by some other countries. So you get that sort of worldview. And then of course you get the other worldview. 
So, uh, and they, they do clash. I won't, uh, I won't sugarcoat that one. Um, we are seeing a, a real major debate on how, you know, what's the world going to look like for the next hundred years? And this is above and beyond the, the issue of, of, um, of climate change and COVID. This is even bigger than that. Is, is, uh, so, so, you know, the UN is one of the theaters where, where that is being played out. On the structural, uh, structural reform, um, there has been, we, we're very happy that we've been able to reform the UN uh, system in terms of the development system. So major changes have been put in place there. We agreed to uh, the reforms about a year and a half ago. We are now in the implementation stage changing the resident coordinator uh, structure. So that is advanced uh, very well, and we're looking at how COVID-19 is testing that reform. So this is actually was a, quite an achievement, and I, I do, I do uh, uh, give credit to Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General on, on achieving those, those much needed UN reforms. Now on the actual reform of, you know, how we interact with the UN and the structure of the UN, as you know, uh, there's been uh, a discussion on the reforms of the UN Security Council. Again, no, obviously, so far, no uh, consensus on that. So it just goes on. On the General Assembly, you're quite right to say that uh, the strength and the weakness of the General Assembly is the fact that none of its resolutions are binding. So the UN Security Council has, uh, uh, has those powers. It can impose sanctions, it can, it can and, and, and they there is teeth to, uh, to some of their rulings and, 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 and decisions. Not, not so the GA. And so the, the GA, I would, I would personally describe it, and this, this is not a Canadian necessarily official position, as an aspirational body, one that lifts up and provides a way forward and, and kind of hope that people will go in that direction. Um, and it does not adequately represent probably population because the, those that we're dealing with at the UN are the governments, a legitimate or not, of, of their countries. For example, Canada does not recognize the current uh, government in Venezuela, but that is who's at the UN. So, um, and you would say a lot of Venezuelan may not recognize that they're being represented by those that are at the UN. So there are these challenges, and I don't want to just pick on Venezuela, but you can just imagine the others. So we, <clears throat> we, so what you're saying is, is an issue, and uh, I personally would like to think that if the world uh, had had a vote uh, on the UN Security Council, if every citizen around the world, global citizen, could have voted, I think we could have probably have won. But we, are the, we were the recipient of a vote by the government the, of those countries. So, and Canada is very, for example, very outspoken when it comes to human rights. And uh, so we don't, you know, that is not always well received by, by some, by some uh, countries and regimes. And I think um, I won't, uh, you know, I won't go any further on that. So, so you can understand that you have in me a fan with this idea uh, but uh, of a parliamentary of sort. Um, and, uh, but also you have in me a realist in that there are too many self-vested interests in the status quo to, uh, to potentially hope for that to happen. Um, it's very disappointing that the UN Security Council, which is a, a structure that really was last updated, I think in the 50s or 60s, it was, it was expanded at that time, uh, is, is now still reflective of a world that is completely uh, gone by by the dodo birds, and and now we we're stuck with this structure, where the many parts of the world are woefully unrepresented on the Security Council, uh, are, are relegated to elected status and rotation, and other countries have not only a permanent seat but a veto. Uh, so I my vote would be to fix that first, um, and and then see what we can do with the General Assembly because I really believe that. If we, had, if we had a better functioning Security Council, uh, that would go a, a very long way in terms of representing the will of, uh, of the world population. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Shawshank. Thanks, Nasser, for the answer to that one. 
I think the biggest challenge is matching realism with, uh, you know, what you think is the best thing to do and matching that as policy experts. So, you know, good luck with the fellows for that one. But next, our question is going to be Arantadi Panda. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but I know you wanted to Hi. ask the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Christina. It's Arun uh, So good evening from India, and it's a pleasure meeting you, Ambassador Blaze. Uh, when we usually talk about SDGs, my observation as a common civilian is that it's the countries which are taking accountability and working towards them, which is a great thing, but you also, also mentioned lack of appreciation for the UN. So I wanted to know, does UN have any role in building trust with countries when it comes to SDGs other than funding? Thank you so much, Arundhati. I will, uh, I'll answer your question. I'm always very honest and, and again, perhaps uh, dangerously so, but so far so good. I, um, I have sat in that room during high level political forum uh, every summer. Uh, this summer, unfortunately, we couldn't do it because of, of the pandemic. But sitting there listening to um, each country's report on their, doing their voluntary report on their VNR, we call, on their, where they're at with the implementation of Agenda 2030. And I, what has struck me uh, so much is how seriously uh, developing countries take Agenda 2030, how diligently at the national level they are watching the, um, their progress. And their presentations are, are, are rich and, 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 and uh, really inspiring in a way. And you really see in these moments just, oh my God, we are achieving the SDGs. I mean, if you leave it to these countries, we'll be there. And these are the countries with the biggest challenge, the ones that are starting from further back and trying to make them way, their way to, to achieving all the different uh, goals. Then you hear you know, from the developed uh, big countries, including Canada, I will say this. I'm proud that Canada, when we presented our VNR two years ago, we had indigenous people at the table. We brought, you know, they came to uh, assist us. We had uh, cities were present, civil society. We made sure that our presentation were, was truly holistic and I was very, very proud of that as a Canadian. But at the same time, I have to say, being part of the genesis of leading up to the VNR, I, I can see that at first when we negotiated the SDGs, we thought, great, Agenda 2030, Canada, we were so proud of our role because we played a, a quite a helpful role in the negotiations. And then that was it. Then there was really not much done for about a year or two in Canada. And, and the SDG, um, achieving the SDG resided in, the, in our development ministry, well, which is part of our global. But it showed that we saw the SDGs as somebody else's goal. It was, you know, it's, it was a developing world that needed to meet the SDGs. And us, Canada, we were fine. And, and slowly over time, we realized uh, there was a realization by the government that no, 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 the SDGs apply to us too. And we have to, we have to, to meet them. And we, uh, our, uh, our prime minister came to uh, Anga High Level Week, uh, I want to say three years ago, and is, he focused his speech on indigenous um, reconciliation in Canada. And he pegged every single aspect of it to the different goals, he drilled them down. So that was, I think, the first indication to the UN system, to, not the UN system, to the Canadian system. Oh my goodness, the prime minister just spoke about the SDGs in Canada. We better get our act together. And of course, you know, uh, we have since. But um, so there, are, I'm working with groups in Canada that are trying to um, better coordinate our efforts between all the different levels of government, which have such a huge role to play. Um, and we, um, and also civil society, private sector and all that. So, but it's, it's work that is, that is not, that is not easy. There's a lot of uh, independent efforts happening and the private sector is now stepped in into the SDGs, which is lovely to see, but there, there just this need to really um, bring all of those pieces together is still something that's, uh, that we're working on. But I think it's absolutely fundamental and I was very happy last year when, as part of the uh, Secretary General Summit on Climate Change, the same one where Greta uh, spoke, um, 
he invited uh, Montreal's mayor, Valérie, uh, Valérie Plante, another great woman, to, uh, to, she was the only mayor invited, but to talk about what the city of Montreal is doing in terms of uh, climate uh, mitigation and, and uh, adaptation and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, but we need to go beyond these, you know, one-time panel and we're looking at it again. She'll be coming back probably, you know, breaking news. She'll be coming back to the UN virtually this year to, to continue to work on, on this issue. So on the part of the Secretary General, I think there's a real uh, realization that we have to break the, break the system so that we're not just addressing this from a federal government perspective. I hope that was helpful. It's such Thank a complex you. issue, it's, it's hard to be brief. All right. Um, thank you, Ambassador. So uh, thank you for the breaking news and for all of your insight. So we have about um, we have a couple of minutes left because I know you have a busy schedule. So we have time for one or two questions. And I saw there have been some spirited debate uh, that's going on in the chat. But let me just um, quickly go to uh, Upasna really quick. So let me have her ask her question and then I guess we could close out with one more. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good evening, uh, Ambassador. Thank you for being so candid and it is really inspiring to uh, hear certain insights from you. So uh, I am an advocate by education, ma'am, and uh, an assistant professor educator by choice. So, uh, Basically, my question uh, relates to the topic of rule of law. As you have yourself suggested that uh, certain UN agencies have proved to be a success like UNICEF, but there are doubts created uh, regarding the transparency of other international organizations, particularly world, uh, like WHO. World Health Organizations, which is in uh, currently in debate because of the COVID pandemic and the, uh, the level of transparency expected was not matched. And the doubts are bigger when we come to realize that the donors, the funders of these organizations are largely private organizations, which might have, I'm not suggesting, which might have ulterior motives. So can international organizations be put accountable to the standard of rule of law? And by rule of law, I mean the general uh, idea of rule of law, that accountability, transparency, democracy, predictability, and equality. Can it be made accountable, international organizations, so that there is more trust built up towards them? Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I think uh, you touch on, on really one of the thoughts that I had at the beginning, trying to talk about how do we build the credibility of the UN uh, to the levels of, of probably what it was, used to be 50 years ago. And, and I think you're right. It goes that it's not just a communication exercise that has to happen. It, it has to go through building up that accountability, which will in, you know, in turn lead to trust, as you mentioned. So um, it's not wrong to say that the UN system, their entities and agencies are, um, it's a big bureaucracy. It's, 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 it's a huge world. And it's one where uh, you have a certain, um, let's say, uh, what's the word? I, let me choose my word very carefully. Um, where certain rivalries get played out. Um, I think that's very difficult to avoid. It's, it is, the UN is only as good as its member states at the end of the day. It is a reflect, it's a complete reflection on us. Um, and uh, nothing that happens at the UN in the UN system is not just reflective of either the member states, what we're doing, or, um, human nature in general. It's, it's certainly not immune to any of those things, no matter how idealistic it may be. We, um, I won't address the WHO issue. I, I think in Canada has said that right now we need to focus on dealing with the crisis 
and uh, and but I think like other many other countries, we would like a thorough um, study. I won't use the word investigation, but study of what actually happened and what we can learn from it. I don't think Canada is in it for the witch hunt part of it. We're in it for making things better for the next time. So, and I think that I, that is shared by many countries. Um, but when I was uh, when I was vice president of UNICEF last year. Uh, and it came out, there was a very, very um, eye-opening report that came out, internal report, about um, the health of the organization. Uh, from, and, and what came out, it, the report was commissioned, uh, it was an independent body report, was commissioned to look into sexual harassment coming out of the Me Too movement. Uh, you know, the UN, unfortunately, is again not immune to that. And, and we have, we've had some terrible problems with some peacekeepers and because and, in many countries around the world, the UN is, is sort of holds a lot of power. When you have that, you can abuse the power and it translates, unfortunately, in, in, in very egregious um, sexual harassment and sexual exploitation uh, inc incidents. So the report was commissioned mostly to, uh, to find um, the, you know, the level of incidents and whether UNICEF had the right mechanisms to address these issues and complaints. What it found is that, yes, there are some cases of that, but what UNICEF had as a almost bigger problem, more systemic problem, was a, a problem of systematic abuse. And it is because in a place where everyone joins for, for idealistic reasons, and in a place like UNICEF, where everything you do can save a child's life, um, it's easy to be put in a position where by superiors or others, you can be, uh, you can be um, um, you know, in the name of the mandate, forced to do things, work beyond your capacity, or do things you normally wouldn't want to do, right? So there is something about these kinds of organizations that I think we really need to deconstruct and look at because, and you get different cultures. This is a place where you've got leaders coming from all over the world, they're handpicked, we all kind of vie to get our Canadian as a deputy director and so, so and so. So you're getting all these cultures together, working together with different backgrounds, different, and, and it, is, it is, you know, you really have to systematically make sure that the organization uh, focuses on its own health, and and under Henrietta Four, it's it's now doing that, and it's working through some of the some of these issues. So I think I wouldn't be surprised to find, as we look into the WHO and its response to COVID nineteen, that there were these kinds of issues that were at play, dynamic between. And I come back to what I was saying earlier: it's all about people. And if you don't, if if your if your people aren't healthy, if 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 as an organization you're going to have some issues. And if you have uh, too much power in the hands of one over the other, it can lead, and there's rivalries between the organizations. So it's not alone in that. I think private sector, big companies deal with this, but because it's the UN, it's that much more important that we fix these issues. And I wanna say that now we have had, you know, there's been issues with UNRWA, if you followed with the leadership of UNRWA. There's, so we, we will never really convince the donors um, if we don't fix those systematic issues within the UN system. And the reform that I was describing earlier, I think was helpful. It shaked things up a little bit. And when you do a reform as important as that particular reform, you're, you are by definition taking power out of one sector and giving it to another. You're shaking things up. And, and I think that's a positive first step, but it's, we also need to address uh, uh, the sound management of all those organizations and try to take as much as we can the politics out of it, which I know is uh, difficult and naive, but is absolutely uh, crucial if we're really going to restore uh, the health um, in, in terms of the, those organizations. And don't get me wrong, they still deliver. I'm not, this is not, these, these places are still delivering. It's just that what more they could do if, if, that was uh, addressed. That's, it's, it's what's lost that's the problem, uh, in my view. Uh, so much more can be done. All right, so thank you so much for that answer, Ambassador. Um, we will have time for one more question, um, and then we'll do a quick close up. So Suleika, um, your question, and, and then we're good. Sure, am I audible? 
Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Good morning slash good evening or good afternoon to everyone, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you, Ambassador, for all your very uh, frank answers. So I have something um, very something which is always brushed under the carpet and um, about unpaid internships at the UN and how it affects individual access for aspiring professionals from, let's say, lesser advantaged sections of the society. Because coming from my direct experience in Geneva, mm -hmm. I, will, I could be there because I was supported by a scholarship, but then I could go in, not allowed to continue into the secretarial levels. So then how, how do you ensure that in the secretarial support staff there's enough diversity when at the same time you can't have, I mean, if you're not paid, you can't come all the way to, I don't know how it's in New York, but you can't come to Geneva, Vienna, and support this exorbitant living costs. So how do you address that situation? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I'm very happy to say that a few years ago, in the case of Canada, because we do, we, uh, before COVID, our mission to the UN would have two interns per semester. And... Um, used to be years ago that there was unpaid and of course the people you know the interns you get tend to be those who have the means to be able to 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 come to new york and and work not necessarily the most deserving although they were deserving of course but um so we've changed this and, and canada now has a policy and, and across the government of canada not just abroad but in general unpaid internships are now basically um no longer uh, allowed so all interns are now paid uh, when they when they join the government, so that's we fixed our own house in this area, and I'm very happy to have done that. That being said, even if you pay them, uh, the, the cost of New York is just you know it's it's probably very difficult for them to be able to break even on 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 that, and that's just a a New York uh, issue, and I'm sure it's the same in Geneva. Um, but as far as the UN is concerned, it's not an area that I've focused on. I know that the UN, and when we come back to this issue about, about the fiscal management of the UN, it's the UN is, is on the precipice all the time of, of default. And it, it has, the UN does not have the ability to borrow. It does not have the ability, it can only rely on the cash that they receive from, from member states. And, and when that runs out, there is nowhere they could go, no bank, no organization for even for a bridge loan, you know, to make it to you until they get the next uh, a payment, major uh, payment. So we're constantly dealing with, with financial, uh, press a financial precipice at the UN. Before COVID, they stopped. We couldn't do any events outside, outside of six o'clock. We couldn't, you know, they closed the, they turned off the escalators, they turned out the elevators, <laughs> the, the elevators, um, you know, because they weren't able to meet uh, the, the cost of running uh, the, the UN HQ. And what they felt is, let's, let's cut down on those costs, not on the field costs, because that's, you know, obviously we don't want to, to do that. So, so there is a real, um, a real issue with financial management at the UN and any new, uh, any new program, any, anything we call them PBIs or anything that has an added budgetary uh, consideration has to go through uh, fifth committee and well, first C CABQ, then fifth committee. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of countries that are just, well, just they're watching like a hawk to make sure that the UN does not spend one cent more. And so uh, uh, I'm not excusing the issue of internship. I personally believe that intern uh, interns should be paid uh, and I for the very reason that you've described because it creates this, uh, uh, unfairness into the system um, and I, I don't understand why because they have their original program I don't um, I don't understand why they haven't been able to find the budgetary item to be able because it's not really in the scheme of thing all that expensive but what I'm going to do is I'm going to look into it with our fifth committee expert and try to find out if that's ever come up because now you've made me uh, a little bit curious about it. All right. So thank you for your time, Ambassador. And thank you for answering all those questions. And, you know, to the last point, you know, money really makes the world go round. And 
I wish we really could have um, abolished unpaid internships. I know that would have really helped me when I was in college. But no, I really do appreciate all your insight and your uh, valuable points and everything. And I learned a lot. And as someone who sort of operates in the UN space, it was very insightful to hear what you had to say. And I'll quickly move over to Christina so she could uh, give her insight or thoughts on anything. Yeah, I mean, I th thank you so much, John. I think that the big lesson here is that, that there really is a difference between, you know, what ideally you would have done and then how the world works. And that includes money, that includes diplomacy, that includes human relationships. And I think my experience with the UN is that you do have, you know, representatives of governments, not necessarily people making these decisions. And that adds another layer of complexity. So to hear these things, frankly, you know, from the inside is so helpful. And I, I can only imagine how helpful it'll be for all 30 of you as you embark on these studies. Um, so I'm excited to see what you all do. I've learned a lot and it's a great way to spend the morning. So um, I'll hand it over to, you know, if there are any final comments before we all head off and, you know, go change the world. Ishan, anything? Yeah, so I, I was just going to say uh, that uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, uh, Your Excellency, to have you here. And uh, again, I am I'm, uh, very happy about the fact that this happened, but I'm also a little disappointed that we only had uh, this, this paucity of time to deal with because as we speak, we're having questions pouring in. And, and uh, the, both in my private chat box and in the group chat box, we're getting uh, questions. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to figure out another time and we'd look to uh, carry on this cooperation, collaboration in the future. I know that uh, as a professional in the field uh, and, and having, having worked at the UN, like many of us uh, in this group have, uh, I am learning things that I would never have learned. Uh, everything that you've mentioned from from the breaking news bit to, to uh, being seated on the seats, uh, on the stairs, to the actual workings of the UN. All of these are insights that I would not have got uh, in any other talk. So thank you so much. And, and thank you for being so encouraging at the, at the heart of your talk about uh, women empowerment, about education, about climate change, about youth development. All of these are such important issues and thank you. Uh, it brings me great joy that someone of your stature is actually considering these issues as important issues and, and I can see <laughs> about it, that you're actually working towards these issues. So it's, it brings me great hope and I could not be happier for, for myself. There's a selfish motive and uh, for all of the fellows here. Uh, and, and again, thank you so much. And we'd be pestering you going forward uh, for more of your time. And I'm sure the fellows would, would be elated to uh, get some more of your time in the future. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you, John and Christina for doing this. I, I think you were uh, brilliant. And to all the fellows, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a very important part of this fellowship to uh, enable intra-cohort interaction. So please, uh, Please interact with each other going forward. We have Facebook groups, we have LinkedIn groups. Uh, please add each other, discuss everything that is happening in the world. Uh, again, uh, Her Excellency was kind enough and, and uh, these are some of the thoughts that you should build upon and, and try and make a difference in the world. That's the whole idea of G-Thoughts Fellowship. So thank you again and, and I look forward to further communication from all of you. And as I mentioned, I just want to reiterate our, our gratitude towards uh, Your Excellency. Thank you again. And, and we look forward to getting in touch with you again and probably being selfish again and taking some of your time to ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. It's such a pleasure Thank having you. you. And, uh, let's let's uh, carry on the conversation forward. Thank you so much. For all of our fellows joining in from different parts of the world and the team behind this, uh, thank you. The best. And please, you can reach me on Twitter. That's the easiest way. You'll find me and you can direct message me. If you follow me, I'll follow you back. Just tell me um, and then I'll, uh, and you can reach me there at any time. Thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you, Ambassador. You have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
So guys, I know that all of you are jumping out of the conversation for those of you who are still here. Uh, thank you again for joining in. And please, uh, one of the very important aspects of this fellowship is to establish that connect within yourselves. We have people from diverse backgrounds, nationalities, age groups, expertise. And uh, I just hope that all of, your, all of you are able to build upon each other's work and contribute to each other's professional uh, and academic uh, pursuits. So please uh, connect with each other, connect with us. Jonathan, Upasna, Sasha, uh, Jan is with us. Again, thank you so much, Jan, for being here. You're also a mentor uh, for the fellows. Ernie is here. Thank you.